Welcome. It's nice to see so many people that uh, we need to add chairs. That's a nice problem. I'm very pleased to introduce the speaker tonight, Miwon Kwan. She is uh, the first speaker uh, this year in the talk series, which uh, many of you may have attended. A uh, program to uh, bring here distinguished scholars, curators, and artists. A program that is a joint program between the Art Reykjavikart Museum, the, the Icelandic Art Academy, and uh, the Center for Icelandic Art, or Icelandic Art Center, rather. Uh, Miwon Kwan is a, certainly a distinguished scholar and, and curator. She uh, has written extensively about contemporary art, uh, including a book uh, that ha many of you may know because uh, you know, it has been used in uh, art history at uh, the University of Iceland, called One Place After Another, Site Specificity and, and Locational Identity, a book that uh, came out in, in uh, 2002 and uh, has really changed the discussion about this this concept of site specificity uh, and the whole uh, practice ar around that, the book of, of contemporary art history and uh, and theory, and I I know it has influenced and changed the discussion because I was very much a part of that discussion in the United States, so it was a very refreshing uh, rethinking of. And uh, she has worked extensively as a curator also at the Whitney, Whitney Museum in New York in the early 90s. And, uh, and most recently, a very important exhibition that she co-curated at the Los Angeles Museum of Contemporary Art uh, with Philip Kaiser. Uh, exhibition that's called Ends of the Earth, Land Art to 1974, an exhibition that uh, actually included three Icelandic artists, Christian Guðmundsson, Sigurður Guðmundsson and Hreinn Friðfinnsson, uh, which uh, it's indicative of, of how uh, different this, this exhibition is from the traditional discussion about land art, where, where only a handful of artists are mentioned over and over again, including Robert Smithson, of course, who uh, was a, 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 one, of the, one of the people who started that whole movement and st started to talk about site specificity, etc. And I believe that Mion uh, Kwan is going to uh, tell us about that exhibition and other things. Welcome. Thank you very much to um, everyone at the Art Museum, the Art Center, and the Academy um, who invited me um, to come. It's a long way from Los Angeles, I have learned. Um, hopefully I'm cogent enough for you this evening. Um, um, I am going to present the um, exhibition, Ends of the Earth, Land Art to 1974, as the topic of my presentation. I have not spoken about the show since the opening of the show. I did many talks going up to the um, exhibition, meaning I could idealize all I want. Um, but now that the exhibition opened and I could sort of see the limits, um, maybe I could reflect on them as I um, talk today. Um, as you see, this is the uh, cover of the exhibition catalog, and you might sense right away that on our cover indicates already perhaps a different approach, as you do not see a, a spectacular monumental sculpture in the desert. What you see is a work by Ed Richie, uh, Royal Ro uh, Road Test, a very small booklet, and it's a work that's usually associated with California conceptualism, perhaps a little post-pop. Um, it ended up as kind of a signal image for our exhibition and um, already a cue as to a different outlook on thinking about land art. 
The exhibition opened in Los Angeles April last year, ran um, or May actually, um, ran through the summer, and then it traveled to Haus der Kunst in Munich. Some of you saw it there, I think. It closed in January. Um, those were the only two venues, perhaps um, appropriately so. Um, and the exhibition came about because Philip Kaiser, who was um, senior curator at MOCA at the time, who I had known just you know, somewhat socially, somewhat professionally, approached me with this invitation that, um, and he said, Miwan, you wrote a whole book on site-specific art and you never really talk about land art. Um, don't you want a chance to um, follow up on the book? Um, by tackling this topic with him. And I think he felt also it was a topic that was too big for one person to try to undertake. Um, and I don't know why, but without even a pause, I said, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> um, and, and then it was, you know, a roller coaster of great difficulties, both institutionally. MOCA was not fully behind this exhibition. That's another story, MOCA's story. Um, but also the difficulty of dealing with a uh, a period in which some of the artists are alive with great um, investment in their legacy. Um, group of artists, many of them, who were great friends during the period that this movement is emerging, but who are mortal enemies, who will not talk to each other or want to be in the same show with one another, etc. A um, lot of emotionalism was uh, kind of in the background of the show too that Philip and I had to navigate. Um, in terms of um, MOCA, um, it, was, it was an exhibition that needed to happen at MOCA given MOCA's own history of revisiting the 60s and 70s and doing these kind of historical research oriented big shows um, over the you know, past 15, 20 years. These are catalog covers of those exhibitions. Um, one on minimalism, another on conceptual art, another on performance, another on feminist art. So, Land art was kind of one area still left to do. And Philip Kaiser, when he took the position at MOCA, one of the shows he said he wanted to do during his interview was a land art exhibition, in particular because Michael Heiser's Double Negative, one of the most famous works in this category, is in the permanent collection of LA MOCA. What that means? What does it mean for a land art work in Nevada, in the desert, to be in a permanent collection of a museum? We can talk about that um, uh, as maybe at the end of the end of the um, talk. Um, but, but during the um, preparation for the show, I would say this was the image, this was the work that kind of propelled us to think about an alternative uh, narrative, or at least um, multiple alternative narratives. I don't know if people will recognize this image, but it's not Heiser or De Maria or um, what's his name, Smithson. Um, <laughs> um, Jean Tangley, um, outside of Las Vegas in 1962. Um, and I will talk about this work in a, in a bit. Um, so it's an exhibition that included over 200 works by approximately 80 artists internationally from South America, North America, Iceland, um, Japan, um, Eastern Europe, um, Israel, et cetera, et cetera. And just the mention of 80 artists was a shock to many people that, you know, no one really believed us that there were that many artists to include in the show. Even Nancy Holt, when I told her how many artists were involved, she um, said that's impossible. She thinks there's eight artists <laughs> in this category. Um, of course, she's one of them. Um, but anyway, as, um, as most of you probably know, um, the discourse of land art has been dominated um, more or less by these three canonic figures, Smithson, Heiser, and um, De Maria, and also three works, I would say. This is double negative, Michael Heiser's um, cut into the Mormon Mesa um, outside of Vegas in Nevada. It's 50 foot long, 30 foot deep, um, no, 50 foot long. This is a view taken close to the time that it was made. Um, and this is more or less what it looks like now. 
or actually this is almost eight years ago. It's more and more degraded. Anyway, this work, um, often referred to as a ne the negative sculpture, um, is 1,500 feet long, 30 feet wide, um, and uh, 50 feet deep, and um, it required 240,000 tons of dirt and stone to be removed, excavated, in order to make the work. And the lore is that um, Heiser did it all by himself. Um, the other work, of course, is Spiral Jetty um, in the Great Salt Lakes of Utah, um, 1970, just on the heels of Michael Heiser's work. It's also 1,500 feet long. Um, and 15 foot wide. Just so you know, double negative was originally 1,400 feet long. And then Heiser learned that Smithson Spiral Jetty is 1,500. <laughs> <laughs> and he got extra funding to make it that much longer. I'll tell you all sorts of little anecdotes as I, as I go through the, uh, um, they're very amusing and um, anyway, so Spiral Jetty. Um, this is, you know, my own shot with, you can see some of the figures. Um, the Heiser piece and um, Smithson's uh, was largely sponsored by Virginia Duan, who I'll talk about in a little while. Um, the third work, canonic work, 1977, a little later, is of course Walter DeMaria's Lightning Field in Quemado, New Mexico. It's 400 polished stainless steel poles. Each are two inches in diameter. They end in a spike. So if you know his bed of spikes work, um, it's actually, a, you could think of it as an enlarged version of that. Um, each stake is 202, uh, 220 feet apart, and they're laid out on a perfect grid, one mile long in one direction, one kilometer in the other direction. Now, these three works really have been the dominant iconic representations of what land art or earth art represents, which is to say monumental sculptural endeavors out in very remote locations, far, far from city centers for sure. They deal with difficult landscape and also that um, the scale of operation is such that they exceed the gallery, exceed the museum, et cetera, and that therefore they also exceed the market, um, that they're kind of outside of the art world in some sense. Those are some of the aspirations. Now, oh, here's my, um, my own shot, which if Demaria knew would um, <laughs> but, um, that too we'll talk about the issues of image rights and such. Um, so in addition, sometimes you get the mention of Nancy Holt, the Sun Tunnel, um, also in Utah, um, and perhaps Roden Crater by James Terrell in which he is still working on the conversion of a um, dormant volcano into a 12 chamber program of kind of observation and experiential um, to light. Um, so that's what I knew starting off also. I was educated to um, repeat that information as my understanding of what land art was about, even though perhaps I knew a bit more than you know, the next person. Um, um, but it was clear, even at, in a more um, in a preliminary inquiry into just that period of mid-late 60s, that there was a very um, unarticulated field of multiple experimental practices and that there weren't any real categories that would house these practices in any um, stable way. So you would see the appearance of Walter de Maria do what would be typically later associated with earth art or land art as the kind of the poster image for Arte Povera. Um, and De Maria himself describing um, a piece, this is called Art Yard, it's a Fluxus anthology that um, comes out of his kind of music and performative um, early years in which he, he's describing what I would say is a pretty spectacular earthwork which is a kind of an explosion um, at a mega scale um, that um, is at, at the same time kind of a party. Um, so it's kind of a happening um, mixed with fluxus and earthwork at the same time. So in some sense, um, it was very clear that um, these categories, happenings, body art, performance, land art, um, conceptual art, post-minimalist sculpture, 
you know, the ones that um, are the movements that we teach in class um, and organized textbooks, that this these categorizations actually, once you just start looking a little carefully, actually don't hold as categories. And um, um, more than anything, given that condition, and I think that's true of all practice, you know, it's like people like me, art historians or critics, who want to come and put a little bracket and, and say this is this kind of a movement. Artists always hate that, as you probably. Well, most of your artists probably, you hate that, <laughs> being pigeonholed into a category. But, um, but it's clear that those categories emerged. Um, they've developed for various reasons. They've become entrenched. Um, they've become mythologized. They're canonic. Um, and somehow they're not movable, it seems. So my attitude, and I'm speaking for myself only, I can't really speak for Philip and his um, specific interests, um, was to pretend I didn't really know anything about land art, to be very naive about it, and to just return to this period, to return to this moment and see what, um, what was shown. What did people see when they saw, went to an exhibition or read about something in a uh, magazine? How did this category come to be? Um, who, who articulated it and why did people agree that there was such a category? Um, so in some ways, I would say the um, interest for me in devoting, what, four years, maybe a little more, to this was um, an epistemological inquiry, which is to say, how does a body of knowledge get formulated and get categorized and defined and then become entrenched in discourse? And so part of what um, my endeavor was to understand that moment of how chaotic it was, perhaps, um, and also how much was shared by so many um, groups of people across different areas, geographies, and cultures, and also um, how to reset the conversation in some sense. Um, in a way, I was more ambitious than, well, because I was naive, or I made myself naive. Um, so four, of, four um, theses, emerged out of research, and my research also included teaching classes at my university with grad students to explore um, artworks and also to track them and get their ideas on what they thought was viable as um, an approach. So this became a pedagogical project for me as well. Um, the four uh, themes, or four, four theses, one, International, this is an international phenomenon. The, um, the sense that oh, let's go back to here. The sense that um, American artists, that this was somehow primarily an American movement, that Americans in the southwest of the United States, in particular in the desert landscape, that that, that was sort of the dominant geography of land art. That mythology we wanted to break with the show, and I think we do so amp amply. Secondly, the myth of land art as somehow an escape from the marketplace, um, you know, the cultural confines, as uh, Smithson might say, um, that it, ex it exceeds the gallery and the art system. In fact, it's very clear that patrons and dealers and curators are at the very beginning, that they're the ones that actually make this possible. Um, so rather than escaping from the art system, in fact, I would consider land art one of the um, practices that expands the market, expands the kind of the professionalization of the field. Um, third is the need to understand land art not so much as an escape from the urban, that's the other escape fantasy of land art, um, that is somehow that it's um, a turn away from culture or cities to um, nature and mother earth. But, some, but that we have to think about this desire for elsewhere as, as uh, for a place of purity or untouched by history, that desire as integral to historical moment of this period, especially um, in developed um, nations, um, of urban transformations. That is growth of industry, growth of technology, expansion of suburbia, redevelopment of cities, and that um, land art cannot separate itself from um, this condition. 
Um, and then fourth, which became a very controversial um, point, um, is that uh, we asserted that land art is as much a media practice as it is a sculptural practice. Um, it became controversial with a couple of the artists in particular, and I'll talk about that also um, a little bit later. Um, let's see. Um, okay, so let me actually um, show you this piece and why. This is Jean Tangli's piece, Study for an End of the World Number Two from 1962. So that means this is already six years or so prior to um, Heiser or others going to this landscape. This was a project that um, was sponsored by NBC Television. National Broadcasting Corporation, one of the mainstream um, television channels for a um, news program, David Brinkley Hour, in which um, this spectacular blowing up of the world was being staged um, outside of Las Vegas um, by Tangley and Nikki de saint -Fall, and it was broadcast on national TV in the United States. My, my conjecture is that Heiser, Smithson, those guys, couldn't have really missed this program. Um, even if, um, so you see in the film, I'm gonna show this to the class tomorrow. I don't know if some of the students are here. Um, you see Tangley, you know, looking for the junk that he's gonna make into kinetic sculptures that will explode. And in the site, of course, is very close to the atomic testing sites. Um, so the kind of the parroting of um, military technology is uh, very explicit. Also, um, the staging of making the kinetic sculpture is just outside of the casinos. And some would say, you know, he's digging through the junkyard of material culture of the United States' excesses um, in the backyard of the culture that's seen as the most degraded, <laughs> that is Vegas and, you know, commercial strip of um, gambling. Um, An end of the world is being sort of staged in its backyard. And then on the day of the event itself, entire crew with the police and camera crews, they go out to the desert to stage the exploding machines, which turns into a kind of, you know, sad because they don't really work very well. Um, but there are some explosions. Um, that's the best one. Um, and it ends with the sunset over the horizon. Now, the, there are many reasons why this would be the signal work for Philip and I. One, it's a Swiss artist, um, that he's out in the desert, fascinated by Vegas and American mass culture prior to the kind of the cowboy type um, that we imagine with land artists, American. Two, it's a spectacle that's staged for television. So media is there at the very beginning as both um, communicator, but also the, you could say even the patron of this kind of um, endeavor. Um, and that it's for broadcast audience rather than somehow like on-site audience there. Um, so it, and identifying 62 as the year that we wanted to say was kind of the, the place to begin also was going to kind of go against the kind of the dominant understanding. Um, so let me, sorry, this is new for me where I have to put on glasses to read. Um, okay, a few words about the title. Titles are so hard and um, ends of the earth. So the exhibition um, with that part of the title um, embraces, um, identifies works in which earth is used as material and a medium. So the words earthworks, earth art, um, they're encompassed in our understanding of land art. Um, ends of the earth as a phrase also um, registers sense of remoteness. Um, so there's phrases in English like to go to the ends of the earth um, or something like that, that you would go to some extreme um, to do something. Um, it also indicates a kind of traversal, moving across space, um, being outdoors or something like that. So it had kind of the right resonance. Um, 
And Dave Hickey, the critic, um, he defined uh, earthworks as concerned with marking out, activating, and controlling spaces. So earth as material is on one side, and space as another kind of, um, kind of medium um, is both engaged in this kind of practice. And the idea of ends of the earth also had this kind of sci-fi science fiction kind of quality, a dystopian um, resonance, something catastrophic. Um, and certainly that seemed also appropriate as well. Um, so we loved it when you know, we landed on that title. Um, and then the subtitle originally was Land Art to 1977. Um, it seemed like a good year to uh, mark. Um, it's the year, more or less, that Nancy Holt finishes her sun tunnels. It's also the year that Lightning Field is completed. It's the year that Charles Ross's Star Axis, this is also a project that's ongoing in um, New Mexico, it's an observatory. Um, you can see it's at a monumental scale and quite monolithic. This is also initiated around this time. Um, Another reason that 77 seemed good, responsible, historically, is that 77 is the year that there's a first museum exhibition devoted to this, this type of art. Um, this is Probing the Earth, Contemporary Land Projects, and it's at the Hirshhorn Museum in Washington, D.C., and it's curated by John Beardsley who's an architect and landscape architect, and he's the author of still the most popular book on this um, art, that's Earthworks and Beyond. Um, I think if you have been t a teacher and you need to find a textbook, that's the one that you go to. He's very oriented toward architecture, and so um, he kind of elevates, or he understands this work as really in, you know, art that's engaging architectural and design-oriented practice. In any case, this show, um, starts in 77 and does a tour in the United States. So we thought, oh, well, we'll end the show as the museum accepts the category. That's sort of the beginning of the end for our show. Um, it's also around this time, 77, that art history is there to theorize it, to historicize it. So Rosalind Krauss's book, Passages in Modern Sculpture, is published. Um, in which the last chapter is devoted primarily to uh, what we now would call land art. Um, as well, her important essay, Sculpture in the Expanded Field, from which I'm pulling this diagram. And in the United States, I don't know about here, these make, these are such dominant um, stories about the post-60s, post-minimalist moment. So the Sculpture in the Expanded Field, in some ways, seemed to explain the emergence of land art really as a, an opening out of sculpture, a kind of postmodernization of sculpture. Um, and then, of course, Lucy Lepard um, earlier had theorized dematerialization, um, and then later in 1983 publishes her book Overlay, which, as you see, Sun Tunnels is on the cover. Um, in our research, it was interesting. There's a kind of blank through the 80s, and then there's a couple of big books in the 90s, but revisiting the same artists. And then again, nothing. And then comes us, just so if you kind of see the literature. Um, but 77, at, at, the, at an early point, seemed like the right place to break. Um, but research led us to cut off sooner. It was very clear. Um, let's see, why do I have him again? Oh, OK. Um, 73. We said, no, that's the year Smithson dies. And we can't say land art ends when Smithson dies. <laughs> that's too, um, you know, like without even trying, that would be heroicizing him too much. 72, I wanted. But um, then so many women would be cut out of the show. And it was important to me that women's presence in this conversation would be registered in the exhibition. So 74 became the year. And in some ways, it became the right year, I think. Um, um, but for some people, it was a wrong decision, because obviously, 
what does not get included when we cut it off at 74 is lightning field, sun tunnel, road and crater, all those canonic works that um, at this point seem to be you know, part of the list. Um, but 74 is the year in which before the um, Hirshhorn exhibition by John Beardsley, Art Park is established, which is in um, um, uh, northeast of the United States, the very idea of outdoor sculpture um, exhibition. Um, it is founded in 74. It still continues, but it's not a, um, um, as you know, um, active. Importantly, 1974 is also the year that DIA Art Foundation is established. And as probably most of you know, DIA is an institution that's committed to few artists long term and very deeply. Um, and they're the ones that would sponsor and ultimately take over the running of something like Spiral Jetty. And DIA's commitment to monumental sculpture in remote locations um, it was clear that they had a lot to do with the development of the mythology and the um, heroicizing of, you know, small number of artists. And so 74, it seemed like before Dia starts is when we wanted to um, stop the show. Um, later, um, 74 also seemed to be the right year, affirmed, in the writings of Frederick Jameson. Um, who thought of 74 as really the end of the 60s. Um, he wrote that um, in his um, essay, Periodizing the 60s, um, that that decade's true end is marked in 1974. Um, it's the, um, you know, the moment of a worldwide economic crisis, the emergence of neocolonialism and neoliberalism, the so-called green revolution in agriculture and so on. And he writes, quote, we may thus generalize um, his, that's Ernest Mendel's, description as follows. Late capitalism in general, and the 60s in particular, constitute a process in which the last surviving internal and external zones of pre-capitalism, the last vestiges of non-commodified or traditional space within and outside the advanced world are now ultimately penetrated and colonized in their turn. Um, late capitalism can therefore be described as the moment in which the last vestiges of nature, which survived on into classical capitalism and at length eliminated, namely the third world and the unconscious. The 60s will then have been the momentous transformational period in which the systematic restructuring takes place on a global scale. Now that's very abstract and it's a you know statement within political economy, but it seemed kind of resonant that um, even one of the authors of the catalog essay, Julian Myers, in our email communication wrote to me, because he questioned me about 74. All the authors questioned us about 74. Um, he said, it might be the case that ends of the earth that you account for in your title are precisely these last vestiges that Jameson is talking about. The difference now penetrated and colonized in their turn. And reading it a little differently than Jameson, that the end, in the ends of, uh, is the end of the avant-garde's investment and faith in an elsewhere. And perhaps with it, the end of a certain kind of avant-gardism based in romanticism that depends on such otherness to articulate its politics and aesthetics. And I think um, this kind of language or this kind of um, Argument is not really internalized in the exhibition or the catalog, but it was kind of driving my thinking um, that the kind of um, attitude about land art as this thing that is out, out there or elsewhere or somehow other than what we know is the, best, the last moment that we could really believe that that's possible. I don't know if anyone can believe that there's an outside elsewhere today. Um, but this was the generation, this is the moment that still really believed it um, and could or tried. Um, so even for that theoretical uh, reason, 74 was the year. Um, and what that allowed us to do was to push against the dominant story of land art as emerging out of minimalism and post-minimalism um, and sculpture in particular. Um, 
I'll show you installation shots and we'll go through, but much con what would be identified as conceptual art or performance art, fluxes, art to povera, those were there in the show without those categories. We wanted to disrespect those categories. We also, in a way, stop before ecological art, environmental art, reclamation art, public art, um, or as some people would say facetiously, garden art, art in the park, art as park, um, those kinds of endeavors um, we also could cut out. We didn't want to go there. It seemed like this is, we wanted to concentrate in the moment from which all these kind of um, uh, paths um, uh, become articulated later. Um, I also wanted to remember um, a very key observation by Dave Hickey. In our research, we found this essay he wrote in 1971 in Art in America. And generally, it's totally lost to art land art discourse. Um, and that may be certain politics of critics in New York, you know, um, Krauss, Hickey. Um, but I think it's worth to revisit. The essay is called um, Earthscapes, Landworks, and Oz. And it's an article that's strangely illustrated with pictures, not of artworks, but of Wizard of Oz, you know, the movie with Judy Garland. There's scenes of that, plus some cowboy shots in the desert. Um, I guess it was at a time when if you wrote an article for an art magazine, you didn't have to illustrate it with artworks. Um, anyway, he, this is 71. He deemed earthworks. Um, that is, he's referring to the works of the three artists that um, dominate. He, des he describes this um, category as already congealed by 71. Um, after the exhibition in 68 and 69 of Earthworks by Duan at the Duan Gallery, I'm going to um, talk about that, as well as the Earth Art Exhibition in 1969, curated by Willoughby Sharp. So, for him, that's Dave Hickey, um, he doesn't take any of the BS that is being touted about this practice. He says, it is not in fact predicated upon the abolition of the object, which is the way that it was being described, or on the circumvention of the art world system, that is the market. He argued that such myths are being produced by the art media. The new seat of power, he said, Art magazines more and more influential in becoming the primary site of art's presentation and the site of critical evaluation. So the media basically is kind of the ruler. And he also likened connected earth art with pop art rather than with minimalism or um, post-minimalist sculpture. And to me, this was so um, surprising, shocking. Um, but he argued that both practices um, operate by bringing something that's foreign to the gallery or the art system from elsewhere, from a distance, into it, and that that internalization is both an expansion but also described as a kind of a corruption of the um, um, art system. And by bringing non-art into art, um, and, and not just in terms of form and content, but he argued that it was producing social and economic transformation of the very art process, that is method of production and types of patrons. And this seemed um, very prescient, um, very important. And in the article, he also um, attends to the kind of machismo and sexuality of land art discourse, um, as well as the mili militarism um, that is the kind of operation that someone like Smithson or Heiser would have to undertake. And he likened their art practice as a kind of a military um, enterprise. It seemed important to retrieve his insights in the exhibition. Um, in addition to expanding also the roster of the artists, which we were able to do, we said yes to women artists, um, very important for the show. Um, yes to some architecture, yes to some landscape design, yes to film, video, and television. Um, let me skip through here. Okay, so um, I don't know, is this interesting? Um, <laughs> so 
let's talk a little bit about internationalization of this. Um, I'll just show you works now. So we already know that American desert is a land of fantasy, land of projection, um, very much supported by American pop culture, the Western movies, television shows, etc. But there were, of course, other deserts and, uh, on the globe that was being um, engaged. In addition to, you know, uh, the European artists looking at the American desert, which I just kind of um, uh, moved through, there's Hans Mach and the Zero Group. Um, who are engaging with the Sahara Desert, um, the Zero Group being kind of a vanguard group that forms in, uh, with Gunter Ucker and others in the late 50s, and the uh, French military operations in the Sahara um, would become their site of um, engagement. I'm not going into detail with any um, of these. Israeli artists um, engaging with their geography and the deserts of Israel becoming, this is... Um, um, uh, Pinchas Goengan's uh, work, Touching the Border, in which, I mean, some of the debates that are relevant today is already there in his work where he's dealing with the borders on the four sides of Israel with this work. Um, or this is also an Israeli artist, a very early reclamation project of um, rehabilitating a quarry. Um, or the North Pole area, Antarctica, with um, anything company and um, um, so we wanted other geographies to be as present as much as an American geography. Um, another kind of direction of internationalization, and at, at one point Philip and I thought we could organize a show formally, like holes, piles, drifts, or something like that. Um, and here's some holes. Um, this is Klaus Oldenburg. Again, just even the name Klaus Oldenburg in association with land art will be surprising to people, but this is a work that um, he did as part of an outdoor sculpture exhibition in New York City, and he basically um, hired grave diggers to dig a grave behind the Metropolitan Museum. It was up for a few hours. Most people either talked about it as negative sculpture or as a real commentary on the Vietnam War, and, um, and, the, and then others also talked about it in relation to um, you know, labor issues. The artist does not make his own work, for instance. Um, sculpture and environment, interestingly, in 67 is one of the early the, the kind of exhibitions where art is being taken into the city. The city is the site for um, the, um, the work itself. Um, so Oldenburg is an important you know, precedent in some way to earthwork and to think about um, digging and there's lots of digging operations that are either conceptually thought, uh, thought through or um, actualized, like in this one, in the exhibition. Um, so Oldenburg might be a surprise to people. Well, here's when the grave diggers took a lunch break, and then it would be covered up again soon after. Um, and then the Japanese group, Group E, um, this is a project called Hole, 1965, um, and probably I'll just um, give you a little more on Group B because they're probably unfamiliar. The name Group E is explained as follows in the group's manifesto from June of 65. Our name E is the E of Tani, that is unit, E of Ichi, that is position, and E of Iso, that's phase. That is to say, we loosely mean each one of us is a unit within the multitude and is positioned within. E, both the group's name and their activities stress the importance of collectivism and anonymity, both common themes repeated throughout Japanese art of the 60s and 70s. Now this is a project that was done for an art festival in Gifu um, district, and it was a one-time art event. And um, given sort of the post-war context of Japan, um, uh, I think this kind of crater that kind of looks like, you know, the aftermath of a bomb drop has obviously a very different, different kind of resonance than it might, you know, in the deserts of the Southwest. Um, so 
about, I think, 10 members, anonymous. Um, they toil for eight consecutive days of digging, um, and the hole reached a size approximately of 10 meters diameter with a depth of 1.5 meters. And then the hole had to be covered back up after the festival due to regulations regarding riverside activities. Now, this group, like so many collectives, you know, disbanded. A lot of them don't like each other. Um, many have passed away. Um, so we were able to speak to one of the key figures um, who kind of now has to be in charge of the archival issues and what to show um, when people like us come knocking on the door and say, we would like to show this piece. Um, this piece was only shown as a, this kind of photograph. Um, this, was this, this was the description of this work at the time in 65 by a Japanese critic. It's a, almost a poet, a poem. Um, dig a hole under the scorching sun, dig a hole, dig and dig silently, only digging a hole, bigger and deeper. Dig, that is their grand desire a hollow hole that swallows the desire of nine individuals, a hole, for example, that is the complete opposite of a grand monument that towers above the earth. Dig, for example, to disturb the earth's surface as a means of spatial awareness that presses on the earth's axis. By spending 10 days performing the illusory action of making a large hole in the earth, they hope to confirm a shared ichi, that is, position, that position is what is maintaining their desire. Concealing a silent irony, it was clear that they participated. Um, very different in resonance, I think, than the kind of um, explosive crater making of some, some of the other artists. Um, we also included Noblo Sekine. This, this work is considered kind of the beginning of the Monoha movement in Japan. Um, uh, idealized as the kind of an origin point by one of their ideologues, Yu Han. Um, you sort of see that this was also for an art festival in which um, some a uh, few years later, um, the hole is dug into the ground. You see the measurements there, um, and then it's replaced back. Um, this is the technology involved in its initial making. Um, and you see uh, other photos where you know, people are holding hands. It's quite manual. And then this is a redo in 2008. Um, more official, um, entire engineering teams involved. Um, this is one of the issues that have come up and I'm sorry, I'm a little bit scattered. I'm very jet lagged too. But um, with this period's work, and I, I think it's not just exclusive to land art, the issue of redoing something in order to be able to show it um, is a kind of a common pervasive condition. Um, what the ethics are involved in doing that, um, how do you keep an ephemeral work ephemeral, but also historically exist um, are, are kind of unanswered um, predicaments or dilemmas of contemporary art. And this, this show was kind of um, confronting all those things as we were going along. Um, Nobu Sekine decided that actually he didn't want to be in our show because, or he, he did, but he gave us like a big poster blow up of this because the gallery um, that represents him uh, Blum and Poe in Los Angeles offered to make the work at the time that our show was up. Um, and of course, the museum can't handle the cost, but the, the gallery was willing to. So the gallery made the piece so we could direct people to go see it, but the gallery made the piece in order to sell the work to the Dallas Art Museum. Um, so land art is totally viable, <laughs> and um, it enters permanent collections. But the interesting thing is that it is 40 or almost 50 years later, after the initial articulation of the work, that the terms of how to sell the work, what does it mean for it to enter a collection, is being thought through 
um, by dealers, by artists, um, by collectors, museum directors, I'm sure. Um, and the terms of it, entering the Dallas Art Museum is something I'm actually trying to research. Um, not just how much a work like this costs, but what does it mean for a museum to own it? And then will, it, will we ever see it again? And if we ever see it again, what are the terms of seeing it again? Especially after the artist is dead. Um, this will come back over and over, this issue of redo. Um, anyway, that was my third hole. Here's another hole um, that uh, we didn't have in the show, but we pursued it very avidly. Not the photograph of the Munich Depression, but um, the accompanying work. This is, um, you know, Heiser. And Munich for us was, oops, well, that was preliminary. Sorry, I'll show you the um, accompanying work in a little bit. But um, Munich was very important as a traveling site for us because um, Germany and Munich in particular is a city in which many of the American artists first realized their works in the um, 60s. Heiner Friedrich was very key to making that possible. Like for instance, the New York Earth Room, which everyone probably knows, was initially done, the first version was in Munich, um, and then Darmstadt, and then New York. Um, uh, so the German kind of dealer and um, uh, gallery structure facilitated the um, realization of many works even prior to some of these artists could do it in the United States. Um, Conrad Fisher will be very important soon thereafter. 